My name is Richard Marks, and I'd like to welcome you today to the uh, 11th in a series of noon lectures sponsored by the Associated Student Speakers Program. Today will be sort of different, unique. It's not going to be a lecture. Our guest will answer any questions that you have about filmmaking, about any of his movies, about his new movie. And to introduce our distinguished guest for today, we have Professor Robert Kirsch. There is absolutely no truth to the rumor that uh, Mr. Preminger will succeed Dr. Hayakawa <laughs> at San Francisco State. Although uh, Dr. Preminger, he's really a doctor. Uh, he's the right kind of doctor. He's a doctor of laws. Uh, was up there at San Francisco State uh, <clears throat> probing around, trying to find out uh, whether or not he could accommodate student unrest and anime uh, to a new picture. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Otto Preminger because I have been <coughs> among those associated uh, with him in a continuing uh, battle for increased uh, candor and freedom of expression. Otto Preminger was a lawyer, an unwilling lawyer. He was an actor, some people thought a very fine actor, but he wanted to, uh, to be a director. And he has directed uh, many films, and some of those films were films which did anticipate the extended freedom of expression, which we have now. I think uh, most of you know about The Moon is Blue, which uh, at the time of its release was denied a seal. Ten years later, received a seal. The Court Martial of Billy Mitchell was a controversial film made against the opposition of the Army which, and the Navy, which felt uh, upset about it. The Man with the Golden Arm was a film which I think began the serious penetration of the drug issue by motion pictures. Mr. Preminger is, uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> not as authoritarian or dictatorial as his press agents would have us believe. Uh, I find him a very humane man, an interesting man, an unpretentious man who confronts each day the practical problem of entertaining and informing people. We in the academic community, students and professors, have a tendency, and perhaps this is part of our function, to assume that this task is an easy one, or that the failures which uh, we sometimes see are the result of some kind of intent. I think we have an opportunity here today to examine candidly through our questions and comments the making of a picture, skidoo, the effect of that picture, and such intent and motivation as Mr. Preminger will undoubtedly reveal to us. So with great pleasure, I introduce Otto Preminger. Whenever I am introduced, it is at once a nice, flattering, thing, and I feel very uh, happy, but it also is, uh, makes me a little uncomfortable because uh, I get perhaps a little more credit than I deserve. And there's one thing, because I think it is important to you and important to me that I would like 
to uh, correct or at least explain. I had several run-ins with sensors, our own sensors in the motion picture industry, which really are not sensors, but it's a, a code administration where we have a code of self-restraint and also with sensors, all kind of sensors, and the police in Chicago, the, and I always fought these sensors and never anticipated. For instance, when I made The Moon is Blue, which I had directed and produced on Broadway as a play, and it ran three years and had eight road companies and played Chicago 18 months and almost all cities in the United States, that when I put it on film, that there would be so much uh, noise about it because the difference between the film version and the uh, theatrical version was only uh, that uh, the people people could see it now for at that time one dollar and twenty five cents instead of paying six dollars in New York, and the reason I defended my right of free expression was never because I felt pretentious enough and silly enough about my work to feel that a little comedy like The Moon is Blue would uh, be uh, suffering so much or that it would be sacrilegious to cut a few lines. That is not the point. My point is that all of us, whether we are movie producers or uh, writers or stage uh, producers or whatever we do, or students, that in our area, in our jurisdiction, we not only have the right, but the duty to defend this most precious right that we have, and that we have in the United States perhaps more guaranteed by the, uh, by the uh, constitution in any other country and that we have uh, still more alive than in any other country because I don't think there is another country that would permit uh, dissidents in case the country were at war to come out and express their opinions against the war. In other countries these dissidents would probably be treated as traitors. But it is very important, no matter on which side you are and uh, what your beliefs are to defend this right of free expression. Because the minute this right start to, sh these rights start to shrink and eventually to disappear, uh, we, uh, the, the free government, the democracy as we know it is in danger because no totalitarian government whether from the right or from the left can exist without thought control and censorship is nothing else but controlling your thoughts and the expression of these thoughts because it starts with people telling you what you can say or what you can write or what you can put in a movie, and that those are, might be very frivolous and little things. But it then continues until you have the same uh, thought control that you had in Germany uh, during the Hitler regime or in Russia. And I was in both countries and I saw it in both. And this leads to fear and leads to injustice and totalitarian government, which I think none of us want. I only wanted to say this thing in correcting, you know, I mean, it is not a special credit that I deserve for having fought censorship. It is something that I think is my duty and the duty of anybody who has a chance to do it. Now, I don't like to give lectures, as I announced before, because I don't know what you might be interested in, but I'd be, to the best of my ability, happy to answer any questions that you pose. Yes? The question, uh, which is my best, are my best films and why, 
is something that I cannot answer. You know, I want to express to you that I explain to you that when I make a film, I concentrate on my work, you know, because it's my life. I love my work and I do nothing else but think of this film. When the film is finished, and I've seen it several times with audiences, and an audience adds something to the film which nobody can really anticipate while he makes a film, two things happen. A, I then feel that I could invariably, in, any, in every case, that I could have actually uh, done much better. If I, if I had the chance to do it over, I could do it better. And B, I then detach myself from the film. I don't even think of it anymore because I couldn't go on working if I would think of my old films. And there's a funny thing that happened. I was uh, one time, uh, about two years ago, ready to go out with my wife. We were dressing, and while I was waiting for her to turn on television, they played an old film of mine called Fallen Angel. And it was just in the middle. And I suddenly realized that I didn't remember how that film was going to end, that I really didn't know the story anymore. And because we had to leave to go to the theater, and I couldn't wait, I still don't know how it ends. <laughs> yes? Well, this is, uh, this is not censorship, you know. It, it would be too long and too technical uh, to explain, because I feel two ways about it. But one thing, it is really a means of the producers, of us, to warn parents. You see, I have two children uh, who are eight years old, they're twins, and I let them see anything. Because I feel that if I succeed to explain to them, you know, as I educate them, what is good and bad, what is wrong and right, what is good taste and bad taste, they don't need any protection by anything. They can see anything. And if I don't succeed, I don't think that any protection, any uh, 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 group that would say, don't uh, let children go into the, the, this film until the, till they're at least 16, is useless. You know, I mean, I think that all this uh, uh, outcry against uh, sex and violence in pictures is ridiculous, because I think that motion pictures and television reflect uh, society. I think our society has become more violent and the cure for it, you know, should be looked at, at the roots, you see, and certainly it's not by hitting people over the head and uh, because that is more violence. And I also, uh, as far as sex goes, we are just freer, you know, everybody uh, has become, I mean, if you uh, uh, check with uh, your older friends or parents, uh, you will find that 20 years ago certain things were just not mentioned in uh, mixed society. I think it is much better now. I don't see why there should be any secret about anything. You can still feel, you know, that perhaps uh, uh, homosexuality is not an ideal uh, thing, you know, but you, uh, there's no reason why a film or a drama or a book or your conversation should not uh, Sh should not uh, deal with it. Uh, you see, this thing, it, it, it certainly uh, doesn't uh, necessarily mean that you uh, recruit more homosexuals. And even if that were the case, I think in a free society, people sh should certainly be able to discuss and think and see on films and everywhere anything they want to. But what good is this freedom if we can't use it? You know, I don't. I think that uh, that pointless violence and pointless nudity or pointless uh, uh, sex uh, is uh, is boring. I, I, I was uh, here last week for a couple of days, and I walked on the Sunset Strip, and they are playing there uh, the, the, the 16 millimeter Cinematheque, a film by Andy Warhol. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's called. Uh, the naked restaurant. And I went in to see it. And I sat there, and uh, for an hour and a half, uh, I saw three completely nude people a nude woman and uh, three nude men. They were, you know, discuss things. It was obviously like he usually does it at lip. They just talked and walked around and they touched each other sometime. And, 
and in one scene they were together, and one, the woman and one man were together in a bathtub. After some time, it became terribly boring to me, you know, because it was pointless. And after some time, I had time to see that this girl, who originally was quite attractive, she became less and less attractive to me. I had so many chances to study the faults in her uh, body. <laughs> and, and the man, you know, became more and more charmless. I'm not particularly interested in nude men anyway. You know? <laughs> but I mean, when they were, the, the, the way they carried themselves, it seemed so pointless, and I left after an hour and a half because, because I was bored. I was not shocked. I, I just think that the experiment didn't work. I think that if it, there had been one scene where it made a story point, where the girl uh, undressed or the man undressed, uh, that would be interesting and I think very uh, right. But to, to just walk around in the nude for the sake of being nude, it's just like if we all undressed here, you know, I think after half an hour, first it might be a shock, but after half an hour we would be pretty, uh, at least I would be pretty disinterested in all of you nude. <laughs> You know, on the other hand, when I look around here and see you uh, dress some of you, I might be curious. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Yes? Well, I didn't uh, talk. This was also a mistake. I was in San Francisco yesterday. Originally, I was supposed to talk at San Francisco State, but it was switched <laughs> to, the, uh, to uh, the city college because San Francisco State is not very much interested in me at this point. However, I had a chance to discuss it there, you know, with many people. I had a press conference and I had several uh, dinner and lunch. And, so, and I, you see, I feel that the, that big mistakes have been made there. And this is only my opinion, and I say it without any uh, prejudice, but I was a little closer to it. I think, for instance, no matter whether you agree with the way uh, Mr. Yakawa, or uh, what is his name, Yavaka, the, 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 acti <laughs> the acting president acts. You know, whether you are agree with him or not, I think that he was rendered completely useless when the governor, uh, who is known as being a very conservative and perhaps even reactionary man, came out and praised him. Because the students must at this moment feel that the president, in his actions, which should be impartial, is not impartial anymore, that he's practically on the stuff of the governor. See, I think by praising him, the governor made a mistake. I personally think that all the, see, I come from Europe, and strangely enough, you know, I, I've been here now for 33 years. As a matter of fact, I went uh, at one time here to the school, I'll tell you this later, <laughs> for a sh very short time. I. Um, <laughs> I um, uh, only want to say that I feel, you see, in Europe, these uh, student demonstrations and the participation of students in the administration of universities is an old thing and happens very peacefully and without any trouble. And, uh, uh, you know, in these uh, discussions, and I don't want to go into it, somebody told me a man, as a matter of fact, is now a, ra a television announcer, was a teacher, and wants to become a teacher again. Is, is it? But you can't let the students decide who should teach them or not. Strangely enough, this is a thing which is a matter of course in big universities in Europe, you know, which are all really not state but government, you know, like federal universities. Because what they do there is that they have, for, uh, they have many professors. I mean, these universities are big for the same subject and the students can choose it but to say that the student at this level should just be told you've got to go and take uh, uh, lessons from one uh, particular man that is not the idea of a university and that is really a contradiction to the freedom of learning because at a certain age I think uh, young people should have the right to choose from whom they learn, you know, they should be wise enough. Anyway, I fa feel that uh, at least all the violence could easily be avoided if uh, the police were not used and if an appeal would be made to the students to, for instance, uh, 
have arbitration, where the university would get some people who are generally known as fair, uh, and the students, uh, some people, and they would form a panel, and the grievances would be discussed, uh, if possible, publicly. And I think it all can be straightened out, because there's one thing uh, in my mind is clear, you don't go to university just to cause trouble. You go to university to learn, basically. You know, I don't think that anybody would waste four or five years of his life in order to just uh, pick it or, or demonstrate. And on the other hand, the administration also must basically uh, be of uh, good will and good faith if politicians don't come into it. And the minute the police comes in, unfortunately, uh, things uh, become passionate in the wrong way. That is my opinion, but uh, don't go by it. Any question? making of, of a new star, uh, you know, you know, uh, you mean Alexandra Hay? Well, I mean, this uh, is the kind of thing uh, that goes with all uh, uh, goods, you know, whether, I mean, this is a sales point, and you can't take this too seriously, you know, the people in, in, the, in the Sunday Times, whether it is here or any newspaper, need for the entertainment section certain features, and they choose them. I mean, they, they called me up at that time. It was we were still shooting and said, we want to do a, a story on, on Alexandra Hay. And I didn't ask them what story. They asked me to, they photographed me. They, they took 20 photographs of me and used one, and one of uh, John Philip Law, who is here with her, I think. And it's, uh, you c this is not in any way serious, except, uh, you know, for selling it. it it's really just like critics are really the problem of the papers and not of the people who make movies. Uh, the same way these articles are, are a problem of, of uh, uh, the papers. I mean, I made a movie and they sent a man who spent uh, a week with me and was very friendly uh, in the South uh, uh, called Rex Reed. He was not very well known, you know. And uh, I contributed somehow to his uh, fame that he has now because six weeks later in the New York Times he wrote an article with not one true word in it you know and very it was funny and I, I didn't take the trouble to to correct it or anything I didn't care that is the problem of the times if they want to uh, uh, dish up to their the New York Times to their uh, readers a story which is completely untrue and pretends to be a true picture of what happens on the set you know, uh, there was not one true word. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of the actors and the cameramen whom he said I f uh, fired, which I didn't, uh, did protest at the times. I mean, these are things that uh, that happen. It's like anything that you read in the newspaper is never quite, it, it is always slanted, A, to the editorial policy of the newspaper, and B, slanted in order to entertain or be uh, amusing. Yes? Well, I, uh, I, uh, the the first uh, the space odyssey I like very much. I mean, I, I say this as a, an audience. I'm not a critic, and I I like very much. I admire, first of all, technically the incredible perfection that Mr. Kubrick uh, reached, and I uh, this is very difficult. He worked really for five years, day and night, only on this film. I. Uh, also found the film fascinating as well as I saw it twice. I have, like everybody probably has, uh, certain questions or, uh, I mean, I, you never like anything 100%, but I think it is a very, very superior movie. And it might interest you that when this movie was shown to the uh, executives of MGM for the first time, uh, they, uh, uh, at least the majority of them, very seriously uh, thought of uh, committing suicide <laughs> because and a and, uh, few of them walked out because they really hated it and when the picture opened in New York and got uh, a majority of bad reviews they uh, 
uh, felt even worse about it, and the picture didn't do too well in the beginning, but then eventually, through word of mouth and through the fact that people liked it, and mostly young people liked it, became one of the biggest hits in the history of movies. Now the uh, MGM people like it very much. <laughs> yes? Could you talk a little louder? Well, I don't know. You know, the, uh, Too Far to Walk is a book that I bought in manuscript a long time ago. And as I worked on the screenplay and did research, you know, I did very much research, including at one point uh, taking LSD, I uh, um, felt that it became more and more obsolete. In other words, the times and the various activities of young people moved far ahead of the book. You know, they, uh, have been trying and I'm still trying to update the story as I work on it, but so far I've not succeeded in getting the right screenplay. And it is one of my principles in working that I don't start the movie until I am satisfied with the screenplay. Even when I'm satisfied, it doesn't always turn out to be the biggest hit, but at least I want to be satisfied. Yes? Could you speak a little louder? Well, I mean, no, not uh, really. I mean, first of all, his whole part was done in three days. And he is, uh, uh, I mean, he has problems uh, in remembering lines by now. You know, he's, he's much older than he looks. And when you are patient with him, it, it works. Why do you particularly ask about problems with Groucho Marx? No. Wasn't, uh, <laughs> well, every actor likes to play God. <laughs> I could have had anybody playing. <laughs> yes? You must speak a little louder. That anything could? Well, uh, the young lady asked me if I believed that anything could be shown in fil films that are pornographic. And I would like to, uh, to explain the difference between censorship and uh, committing an act, an act of obscenity. Censorship means, basically, uh, uh, simplify it, that a group of people, a board, outsiders, a man, you know, who is uh, a city board, a state board, the federal government, tells you what you can put into a film, into a book, into a newspaper, in a magazine, before you do it. In other words, it is really should be called prior censorship or pre-censorship. Pornography you know, is, uh, the word means, something obscene in writing and uh, visually, and, and that is against the law. We have a law in this country, like in any other country, no matter how free society is, obscenity is something that uh, the laws don't tolerate. Now, obscenity is also something that changes with the times and changes, you know, with the society as society moves, you know. Sometimes we go backward and, and it also depends what might be obscene in uh, Los Angeles might not be considered obscene in New York or, or what uh, might not be considered obscene in Los Angeles might be considered obscene in Burbank, you know, in, in, or in smaller places. You see, the, the smaller communities usually are behind. Although this is also not true because when you read all these things that happen in country clubs, in small towns, you know, between couples who swap uh, wives, etc., and then they get terribly outraged when they see a picture where they see maybe a, a slight, uh, uh, slightly nude uh, woman's breast you wonder if they are sincere or hypocritical. But obscenity is something that you commit. You can commit an act of obscenity right here. And then the police would come in, would arrest you, and would uh, put you before a judge. And the judge would then decide, it would be his judgment or a jury, whether it is obscene. The same thing is true of pornography. If you write something or photograph something uh, that is obscene, then the police would uh, prosecute you and you would have to answer in court. That is not censorship. 
Yes? That the society, uh, the, 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 the judgment of society is valid? Well, I mean, uh, naturally, this, 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 the whole uh, idea of our living in a democracy is that we don't submit to judgments of individuals or a small group that the society or the majority of the society decides on everything. And it is valid. Yes? Well, I uh, hope, you know, uh, that I'm not a businessman, you know. I mean, I have all my life uh, followed the principle that I like to do what I think I want to do at the moment, and I succeeded with it. I never worry about money too much, and I have made enough money so far to live very, very comfortably. So I don't worry about it. And to speak about myself as an artist also seems pretentious. If you mean as a movie maker, I must tell you that I cannot calculate the success, and I don't try to calculate the success of a film that I make. I make a film the way I feel, you know, I mean, I choose the story because I am interested. I choose the actors because I think they are right. It's all very subjective. And therefore you might, uh, if you want to be generous, say it is an art, it is artistic. But I do this with the hope that my enthusiasm would eventually become contagious through my medium, you know, on the screen and get other people enthusiastic and they would like what I have done. And sometimes I, um, my judgment is right and sometimes I'm wrong and I have either success or failure. And that is the excitement of my profession. But uh, there is no, I mean, I see, I don't believe that anybody can say, you know, we are going to take now a few uh, parts of sex and a few parts of violence and, and the love story and the star and when we mix this all up it'll become a success. As a matter of fact I can't tell you now as Kidu is finished and uh, whether people will come to see it or not. I hope they'll see it. You know. It's something that, that, that is impossible for me to judge and therefore I don't worry about it. I worry now about my next film which is based on a book that I bought six months ago uh, in manuscript. And see, these are the small uh, compensations or, or the small uh, dividends that you get. Uh, I bought, when I bought this book, everybody thought I was crazy. It is called Tell Me That You Love Me, Julie Moon. It is the first book by a young woman called Marjorie Kellogg. I bought it in manuscript, and it is ha a very strange story about three handicapped people who meet in a hospital, a, a girl and two men, and decide to try to make a live together, when the, uh, a life together, and not mix in society where they expected best pity and charitable, uh, you know, uh, tactful avoidance because they are all crippled, and they want to try to make their own lives and it shows courage and this uh, and I liked it very much. Now the book was published about four weeks ago and received unanimously uh, rave reviews from every book critic in the country and it is selling very well which nobody expected and that is what I mean a little evidence you feel uh, justified in your judgment and now people don't think I'm crazy anymore. <laughs> yes? I didn't get started in films, you know, when I was uh, very young, as a matter of at the age of nine, I felt I wanted to be an actor. My father was a lawyer in Vienna, didn't uh, like the idea. And I, but we were very close and very friendly, and he said, you can do anything you want to if you would just finish some formal uh, studies. So I became an actor at the age of 17, but studied also in between engagements in very small towns in order to learn acting and became a doctor of law. I never practiced, I was never a lawyer. And then uh, by the age, when I reached the age of 19 uh, and a half, before I was even 20, I started my own theater, legitimate theater in Vienna, and I started to direct, I gave up acting. And then I continued to direct and I became the successor to Max Reinhardt in his Viennese theater at the age of 26 or seven. 
And then a man from Hollywood came to Vienna or heard about me and met me and hired me to come here. And I then only started to learn how to make films here at 20th Century Fox. The man's name was Joseph Skank. And I also directed, I don't want to tell you my whole life story, some plays on Broadway, and even taught in, in uh, Yale at the drama school where I worked in New York. And then acted again a few Nazis at the time when it was very difficult to find Nazis in the United States. I wouldn't have this trouble now, so I don't act anymore. <laughs> and I uh, became, uh, uh, and uh, strangely enough, when I came here uh, to Los Angeles the first time, I was interested to see things, and I wanted to see young people. It's always, it's always, I was then only 27, but uh, it was always uh, interesting to me how young people learn or go, and I, in, uh, in I uh, enlisted here or s uh, in into a drama course that was uh, conducted by an ac actor. I even remember his name, uh, still called Antrim. And uh, naturally, I just sat in back and I didn't do much, and somehow, through publicity, one day, he had found out who I was. And he came into class and was raging mad. He, he thought I was a spy or something, and he threw me out. He said, how could I do this, you know, and not so. That was the end of my academic career <laughs> and at, the, uh, at UCLA. Yes? Hmm? Yes, uh, pre-production training, uh, planning is, in my way of making pictures, very important. You know, I do first the script. I don't even start to talk to actors until the script is finished, and then I cast it. And then, while I cast it, you know, I usually have first an art director go out and make most of my films now location and find the right location. He gives me choices, and I travel with him. And when this is all finished, only then do I really determine the start of the picture, the, the starting date of shooting. And then I shoot, and I uh, make the film, and I edit it, and, and there it is. And I preview it, and I forget it. <laughs> yes, the gentleman behind uh, uh, with the beard. A little louder, please. Do I what? Well, uh, you see, this is a very good question, and I often ask this question, whether I do my own editing. I would like to make it clear that editing is part of the director's job. You know. The editor is only there to execute what the director tells him. First of all, the director edits as he shoots. He edits in his mind. He knows exactly what he wants to use, or maybe he gives himself a choice, and then when he looks at the film, then he tells the editor, use this angle, this uh, part of the scene here and there. The editor naturally also has a, an important uh, uh, function, like the cameraman. He, if the more sensitive and the more tuned he is to the director's wishes, the better an editor is, and also physically, you know, there are differences in, in using two or three more frames or two or three less frames, but the director is the editor. Then, according to different contracts, it is possible that the studio or the uh, distributor comes in and makes changes, which is a question of, in my contract, I have the final uh, cut. I mean, nobody can cut anything in my films against my will, at least not uh, legally. I mean, they, they might do it behind my back when I'm not around and, and they play the picture in, in Morocco, but I can't go to Morocco anyway. And um, it is just like, like photography. The director tells the cameraman exactly what he wants to see on the screen. The cameraman's main, uh, main uh, uh, function is to create the mood that the director wanted. But what you see, you know, the way the camera is set up is the director's and not the cameraman's uh, job to decide. Yes? But I can't discuss the future of anything because I'm not a prophet or an astrologer. I think that avant-garde films or off-Broadway or off-Broadway off plays or 
anything or student films uh, are very good and very useful. First of all, I think that film has become more or less the way of expression for young people. Many young people who perhaps in another age would have, would have, and not necessarily people who want to become filmmakers, would have written stories or so, are not doing it visually with, uh, with uh, cameras, with 8 millimeter, super 8, 16 millimeter. I think this is very good. It's interesting for us, and I think that everything that you see, you know, like when I told you this Andy Warhol film, everything that you see as a picture maker that is experimental, whether it is good or bad, but it helps you to decide what you want to do. So every experiment is great in my opinion, and I'm for it. Where it is going, some of these avant-garde filmmakers might become the greatest directors and filmmakers uh, in the world, and some might disappear. I mean, that is difficult for me to foresee or to foretell. Yes? No, uh, I, I make changes on the, but uh, see, I don't, uh, this is uh, maybe a uh, limitation that I have, you know. I don't feel that it serves any purpose to let the actor go beyond interpreting a part that is given to him, you know. I don't like an actor, and, and uh, not because I underrate necessarily the actor's talent, but the only thing is that if you start it, then there is no ending, you know. If you let an actor change his lines once, and then two weeks later when he wants to change his lines, you say, no, stop, then he will pout, because he'll feel he contributed something, and now you shouldn't stop him. But you might feel that he contributes more, it'll ruin your film. It is not, uh, I don't do it, but uh, there can also be made the case for it, for a living. Yes? Well, it is uh, more difficult in color to get the cameraman to, uh, to uh, shoot it realistically. The uh, color is a, an inducement to cameraman to make things too sweet, but generally, uh, the, the, actual, the actual photography is easier in color than in black and white. It is more difficult to do a good job on a black and white picture photographically than in color. The lady behind the uh, a little louder, please. I think if you get up, then everybody will hear you. It's not only for me, but I want the other people to hear the question. Yes? When I like actors, I enjoy the lady asked uh, if uh, there are any actor, actors that I particularly enjoyed working with. I like actors. You see, uh, some directors, you know, like Hitchcock, he calls actors cattle. And many, many directors don't like actors. I don't think he means it either. But I like actors. I like the actors have a kind of open nature, you know. And this, I don't say this against them. They are, because they are extroverts, they have a certain charm and almost childlike charm, which I enjoy and like. And most actors with whom I work are uh, my friends after we work together. And uh, as a matter of fact, there is a young actor here with whom I made two films who came, you know, I didn't even invite him, and I'm very uh, proud that he found it interesting enough to waste his time and come here and listen to me, uh, because he could ask me these questions anyway. And I would like to introduce at this opportunity Mr. John Philip Law who is sitting there. Get up, John. Don't be shy. We will have uh, maybe two more questions. Yes? Well, uh, well, it really happens uh, very rarely, and uh, I first try to persuade him, and I uh, then try, uh, perhaps, uh, it depends on the actor. You see, a director is like a teacher, you know. Sometimes uh, many actors uh, are best accessible if you persuade them and if you are kind to them, which is difficult for me. And uh, other actors need to be a little shaken up but uh, I never had it happen, but if this disagreement should really be very uh, basic and important, I would have to recast the uh, part, because uh, there is one thing about directing, which is uh, in the word, you know, it must be the director's uh, interpretation and the director's picture. The, the picture must be made for better or worse 
the way the director sees it. It is not a medium which has room for committee uh, decisions. Yes? But when you say Hollywood, I would like to tell you, A, that I don't even live in Hollywood, and that since uh, 1952, when, uh, when the independent producer came into being, uh, pictures are really made by individuals, mainly, uh, with some exceptions of cheaper pictures. And, on and I really believe that today uh, there is very little gamble in using uh, unknowns. I think it is just as much a gamble to use a star in a part that he cannot play well, that he is not right for, because he will not only hurt the part and the picture, but also himself and his future, as you can often see, to just use people because, uh, because of their name, then to uh, use a new actor who is right for the part. The important thing for me in casting is to find the people who, in my opinion at least, could do the best job uh, in the part. You know, I don't uh, worry too much about names. And then somehow, you know, for instance, uh, somebody asked me for why I used all these names in Skidoo. That was a joke, you know, I mean, to take all these former stars you know, and line them up and they all play actually small parts and it's like, like seeing old films on television. You know, but they, and they were all very right for these parts. I, mean, when, when I don't know how many of you saw Skidoo, but when, when, when uh, George Raft plays a captain on a gangster's boat, you know, this is naturally a reflection on his past when he played many gangsters. One more question. Back there, the lady. Are you? I can't. Is it really too that? The what? The seal? The feel? Hmm? The feel, I, I, the, f the feel, what you feel? Yeah, the feel of music, movie making? The field. The oh, the field of music, yes, is? Th this is absolutely untrue, I mean, uh, the field uh, of movie making, I couldn't understand, I don't know about fields, uh, I thought it was uh, it's an agricultural expression. <laughs> the, the no, they are never, you know, let me tell you this, that there are never enough talented writers, actors, people who want to direct, produce or any, anything that needs talent is always rare. Talent is rare. As a matter of fact, you hear always people say, my God, we don't, in the old, good old times there were more good plays. I mean, how many uh, good plays do you see on Broadway? It is not, there is, it's never enough talent. So don't let anybody tell you that there are too many good actors or too many good writers in any field. That is nonsense. And as a matter of fact, as uh, the communications expand and we have uh, now uh, in addition to films and the theater also so much material eaten up and so many actors by television we always need more and more actors writers and uh, talent in movies now I will uh, you want one more question here But it is not true that, that, that movies are known because of their actors. But this, again, is a question of selling and not of who really does it. If somebody has a big name, it's like a brand name in any uh, goods, like Kellogg's uh, breakfast food, you know. The people who make the breakfast food are not necessarily the family Kellogg, you know, but they have established this brand name. If uh, Steve McQueen is in the picture and the director is not a very famous director, Steve McQueen's name is being printed bigger and used more in publicity because they think it'll sell the film. It is not always true, you know. Some McQueen pictures uh, attract many people and others don't. But that has nothing to do with the importance. And uh, Mr. McQueen still doesn't make the pictures that he's in. 
he only acts in them, and if he has a director who is really a director, he does exactly what the director tells him to do. Thank you very much. It was nice to see you. Good luck.